What is going on, everybody? What is going on? It's your boy, Nye, and welcome to another episode of the What Is Crypto podcast. I have a very, very special guest on the line with me today. I have David Gerard. David wrote The Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain, Bitcoin, Blockchain, Ethereum, and Smart Contracts. He's a author and a big influential person in the space. In this episode, we are going to talk about is Bitcoin the future of payments and a store of value? We're going to discuss why not Bitcoin because we've discussed why Bitcoin in other episodes. In this episode, David is going to give you the flip side of the coin. He's going to share his opinion on the other cryptocurrencies, aka shit coins, and why they are not relevant to the space. He's also going to talk a little bit about the other people involved in the space, whether they are actually here because they believe in the technology or whether they're just here to make money. Finally, David is going to talk about the future of blockchain technology. Does he really believe that this technology has a future for all of us? Before we get into any details, I want to make the disclaimer again that this is not financial advice. I am not a financial advisor, nor is my guest, and we would just like to give you the best content and the best information possible so you can make your own decisions. So please, don't take any of what we say as financial advice. And finally, please come over to Facebook, join us in our community on Facebook, our Facebook group. In there, we ask a lot of questions, we discuss what's going on, and we have our own unique live streams to really dive into these conversations on a deeper level, and especially to allow our audience to actually have a discussion and participate instead of just listening. And finally, if you want to hear this full episode without any edits, as well as a lot of other really cool content, head over to our Patreon page. You can find all of this information and more at whatiscrypto.com. See you there. Enjoy the episode. I like it. This is going to be a good conversation. <laughs> is Bitcoin the future of payments and a store of value? No and no. So Bitcoin really aspired to be a payment system. Like Satoshi talked about this a whole lot, about using Bitcoin as money and currency for small payments and so on. It sort of pretty much struck out. It, it, it tried for a while and it didn't really work out that well. There's nearly no vendor interest. It has a number of problems as a currency, most of which stem from its irreversibility, which is a design factor. But I think that's actually the source of pretty much all its practical problems. Because consumers, end users buying things, really, really like reversibility. And the existing system has reversibility up to quite high levels for very good reason, because fat fingers happen, let alone fraud. As a store of value, well, this depends on it being useful for payments, otherwise no one would bother changing it for actual money. At the moment, it has some use as a speculative commodity, but it goes up and down like a yo-yo. No, no one really takes it seriously as a store of value if they aren't already Bitcoiners. I'm not sure how that would really work. I mean, it's like you could use rare Beanie Babies as a store of value, but the trouble then is that your collection will be very illiquid afterwards, after about 2000. It's um, So could something like Bitcoin do the job? Let's say, I mean, Bitcoin was literally, it was the first paper and string mock-up to prove that you could even do this idea, right? So that's really quite technically impressive, okay? I'm not going to minimize that. But, you know, uh, I'm a system administrator. Uh, pressing the first paper and string mock-up into production never works out well. So, like, we've hit Bitcoin's technical limits repeatedly. Could something else do it? So far, we've had thousands and thousands of altcoins, and none of them have really made a compelling case. Ethereum has attained some popularity, but mostly Ethereum is used as a platform to run ICO tokens on. You know, um, the um, uh, it has the advantage that Ether is relatively liquid, so it's as, about as easy to change for conventional currency as Bitcoin is, so that's good. But again, it's uh, getting clogged uh, whenever there's an even slightly popular application Ethereum fills. So they're keenly aware of this, and they saw what happened when Bitcoin filled around mid-2015, and they really know what will happen next is just bad. And so they're desperately trying to scale Ethereum. But um, and they're, they're very cautious about it, but they know they have to. But I don't know if there's a way out. I don't know if the structure of making a blockchain-based cryptocurrency is even something that can actually effectively scale without centralization. Uh, 
I mean, maybe it can, but you know, um, like with anything in crypto, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, I will, I will be delighted to be proven wrong that all this is actually good and valuable, but I'll need to be shown it. So yeah, to be a store of value first, it has to have a use case other than being a store of value. And I'm not sure it does. And that's before the incredible volatility and how easily manipulated the price is. And you know, this is, this is a really good conversation. There's a lot of people that are very, very bullish on crypto and, and this being a, a one-on-one conversation, I want to really pitch both sides so people can make the most educated decision possible if they want to invest or if they don't. Oh, totally. Is this something that you've always believed or do you think this is like something that's kind of evolved over time as Bitcoin has grown and, and you've seen the, the, the fail points of it? I first heard of Bitcoin around 2010, 2011. It looks like the sort of thing, it looked like a thing that's technical people who didn't understand anything about the thing they were applying technology to were getting all excited about and there were a bunch of really obvious things wrong with it and I couldn't see it working out well and effectively and I think that's pretty much been the case. One thing that was obviously going to happen is that when you get naive people who think, wow, everything's different now, we've got a new way of doing money, that sends out a sort of bat signal for scammers. And so what happened was the scammers flocked into Bitcoin really early on, 2011, 2012 time we're talking. And what happened? A lot of these people turned out to be serial scammers. Like they, you have some of the quite high levels, like you go into Butterfly Labs, you know, the guys who did the mining rigs that they never actually sent out and they mined all the Bitcoin with them until they were useless, then sent them out. Um, those guys turned out to have mail fraud convictions. They were scammers who came along to Bitcoin and went, oh, suckers, you know. Um, so it's, I'm really disappointed concerned by a lot of stuff about Bitcoin and how basically it's founded on economic ideas that don't actually work out and haven't worked out and things like we gave up on the gold standard because it wasn't working anymore but so making a new gold standard with Bitcoin in place of gold it, it has all these assumptions that are just false and then it tries to work out the consequences of the assumptions but the main draw is at every point is join Bitcoin you'll get rich for free and you know a lot of people did and a lot of people lost their shirts there's a lot of weird and bad ideas going around in the space that are just incorrect. Um, so a lot of people have done well out of Bitcoin. You can totally get rich trading Bitcoin or you can lose your shirt. I would say that for the retail investor, the new person who comes along, treat it as gambling, you know, if you or cryptos in general. If you buy 10 quid of Ether and watch it go up and down in price, you'll learn things you'd never learn any other way. But because someone does well doesn't mean that it's an investment. It means that they went in a gamble. So, you know, if you're a professional trader or you're rich anyway, you know perfectly well that assets can go to zero. You can use your money personally. So, yeah, my thing has always been warn the retail investors that this is a good way to lose everything. That's a good, uh, it's, a good, it's a good warning to give to people just to be cautious and things like that. When I wrote the book, my moral thrust was basically retail investors, keep away, you'll lose your shirts, you know. Uh, but then it turned out my actual audience turned out to be business and finance people um, who, who know perfectly well that things can go to zero. At that point, you go, fine, if you want to risk your shirt, you go for it. You're rich enough to know better. And um, then we can talk about the details. But yeah, but I will, I've always maintained firmly that retail investors do need protection from the uh, scammier bits of the crypto industry, of which there are a lot. So you talked about that uh, in the answer to the last question, that uh, one of the reasons that Bitcoin's come to this point is because of scammers, especially early on scammers, 2011, 2012. Do you think that the space is completely hopeless because of that? Or do you think this is just the phase that once things evolve and grow a little bit, that they'll get weeded out and the good guys will stand out? So I think that regulation is um, come, is only going to go upwards because there was this idea in Bitcoin that if you had a completely unregulated market, everything would be idyllic. Like that trick never works. This is why we have regulation. You know, I was discussing this with someone the other day, actually, that basically one of the big problems for the crypto is that it is largely unregulated. And that means that there's a whole lot of bad behavior goes on in crypto. And that's why it has a bad reputation with the outside world as a space for investment, because it turns out have, having no regulation is good for a few individual players, but it's bad for business. It's bad for the whole space. So this is why people complain about regulation in the US and particularly about regulation in New York, um, where New York has some of the tightest financial regulation in the world because New York is where all the banks are in the US. And if you deal in dollars, your dollars are going to travel through New York at some point and you are going to be subject to New York law. 
So that's hard to deal with that level of regulation and people complain about it bitterly. But why do you want to deal with the stuff that goes through there? Because that's where all the big business is that people trust to put their money into. I mean, obviously, you have to balance, have a balance with regulation and the regulators don't aren't there to harsh the party. They're there to sort of keep the wheels on, more or less. An efficient market will tend to have a bit of regulation because unregulated markets, the wheels fall off in various really obvious ways really quickly. So it's a tricky one. That's one of the big problems crypto has. I think regulation is only going to go up. Like it's increasingly going to be a more regulated space. Um, the CFTC has decided it has ambit over Bitcoin and Ether and commodity type stuff and the SEC over anything that looks like a security. And I think that will be as good for the space as it can be because then it will mean that there's some sort of rate trust going on that it's like in, in stock trading. Usually if you buy stocks, your threat model is not that the London Stock Exchange will scam you. In crypto, it's totally part of your threat model that the exchange will try to scam you. You know, they'll front run you or they'll tell one of their mates to um, burn your margin bet or whatever like that. This doesn't happen to anything like that extent in a properly regulated system. It's because of the lack of regulation that you have this sort of atmosphere of distrust. And, you know, it, it's a pool full of sharks. And so the question for you as an investor is, do you feel, do you feel tasty? <laughs> I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, and our sponsor is Unity Coin, the world's first stable coin diversified to provide you with financial freedom and help the world via giving back through charity donations. The Unity Coin is a stable coin pegged to a diversified index of assets for financial security against a volatile market. While national currencies are inflationary and cryptocurrencies can be volatile, growth and stability come from automated diversification. Unity Coin aims at giving and delivering this automated diversification on a daily basis. One of the really cool things about Unity is it's a nonprofit organization. All revenue after costs are donated to vetted projects. This company is really focused on using cryptocurrency and using their business model to give back to the community and beyond. And what's even cooler is that if you hold Unity Coin, you can have a vote on where that money is donated. You can go over to unity.sg to download their wallet, to look at historical data, and to become involved in the Unity project. I want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, AAX. AAX is a futures trading exchange that has more than your average capabilities. They allow you to do spot, futures, and OTC for low fees on a highly secured trading platform. Highly qualified team that is focused on creating the world's best financial technologies and tools to allow for digital assets to be traded with simplicity and ease. AAX is one of the world's first digital asset exchanges powered by the LSEG. And the LSEG is the London Stock Exchange Group. Leveraging the LSEG's proven and robust and scalable technology, AAX provides institutional grade exchange performance and reliability. You guys can learn more at AAX.com. And I'm, I'm, I want to know more about what your vision is with all of this, like in your opinion, you know, the Bitcoin has, in your eyes, Bitcoin has pretty much failed. Do you think that blockchain has failed or do you think that a new form is going to arise or is this industry just completely screwed? <laughs> Good question. So one of the big problems, by the way, that cryptocurrencies have, proof of work coins have the problem that if you're burning a country's worth of electricity to run your system, then that's an externality the outside world's going to ask about. Bitcoin has been really bad at addressing this issue. It, they come up with complicated philosophical excuses that go, well, if you redefine the word waste to mean something else, then, and so on. It's not, really not very convincing when actually the point is we want to keep doing our Bitcoin thing, which is understandable. But, you know, people are going to look at a system and see what resources it uses and when it's just burning a country's worth of electricity for literally the most inefficient payment system in history. This is not a good sell. I tell normal people about Bitcoin, they go, oh yeah, that silly thing that nerds rip each other off with, because that's the sort of image Bitcoin has in the outside world. And it uses a country's worth of electricity. They get angry, right? They get really angry that this dumb thing is wasting lots of money. So then you have to show that one, it's not dumb, and two, it's not wasting a country's worth of electricity. And they don't bother doing this. 
once they sort of talk to each other. So we think in terms of things like proof of stake coins, for example, or some other mechanism that somehow does the Bitcoin trick of a decentralized currency without proof of work. I mean, proof of work largely centralized by about 2013, 2014 anyway, into a few mining pools um, because it has economies of scale. The idea of a mining mechanism was to use capitalism as a method of uh, enforcing decentralization. But one thing capitalism is really, really good at is ruthlessly optimizing for cost. And it does that by centralizing. So you end up with the opposite of a robust system. You end up with an efficient system instead. So mining rapidly centralized into a very few pools. And when you can have 80% of mining capacity standing on stage together at a conference, it's hard to call that decentralized. So can other things do the Bitcoin trick even slightly? Um, Ethereum is trying. Now, I take their effort quite seriously, and it's been six months away since 2014. They're trying very hard to do this interesting thing. They know that their system has billions of dollars of notional value tied up in it, Ethereum itself and all the various tokens and so on. So they know they have to get it right, and they've spent five years discovering every way it could go wrong. So it's good they're doing that work, but I'll believe they've got it when they release it. Um, there's other smaller coins that claim to have done the trick, and I don't think any of them have. EOS claimed it had, and that rapidly revealed itself to be a, uh, a straight-up consortium of the biggest validators, that sort of thing. So, future of it, um, I think that something like crypto will keep going for ages. It's a trick we know how to do now, so it's it's going to be hard to kill. You know, um, If it's a proof-of-stake coin, then good. If it's a proof-of-stake-ish thing that pretends to be decentralized, sort of, people won't worry that much, I think, as long as it's reasonably tradable. What you'll notice is the markets, the actual real-life markets don't distinguish between coins. You can make an argument that Bitcoin is unique, that it's very, it's qualitatively different. I'm not so sure because the markets don't treat it very differently. You can trade Bitcoin and Ether on, on the same basis as Ripple or ICO tokens, which are completely centralized. The market doesn't care. It treats them all the same. So that's both the trading market and the small payments market. So... I think this thing will linger on for a while. I don't know if it'll find a unique application that really takes off. I haven't seen one. Um, As for blockchains outside of cryptocurrencies, there is no use case for them. Their main use at the moment is marketing and press releases. Like Walmart does their blockchain supply chain thing with IBM. Um, That just uses a copy of Hyperledger's backend data store. It's using nothing blockchain-y or distributed. All the nodes are owned by Walmart and live on the IBM cloud. But if if you said database, you wouldn't be on the front page of section be of the New York Times. But if you say blockchain, you do. So it'll keep on living for ages, but I, I have seen no evidence that it's going to achieve great new heights or exciting new things. And what do you think about everybody else in the space? You know, the builders, the entrepreneurs, the influencers, specifically as a skeptic, what do you think about them? Do you think that they are ignorant of your opinion and, and your belief in your truths? Do you think they're in on it and just only here to quote unquote scam or make money? Or do you think they're like really just like 100% in, in, in blind faith and blind belief what the sect has? I think that there's an interesting blend of all three of those. Like you have people who you say are completely sincere or whatever, but... um. A good example, Bitcoin Cash, like um, Roger Veer, no one can doubt his sincerity. On the other hand, he held his nose and put up with Craig Wright in in on Bitcoin Cash. You're going, why are you doing this? You know that Craig Wright has nothing to offer. What are you talking about? And... It, it's just eventually he realized this, but, um, you know, what were you doing doing that, dude? I mean, I've specifically described crypto as a very complicated Rube Goldberg machine to filter money from retail suckers to about 20 guys. That's maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not too much of one. There are people who build stuff and there are people who clearly are just trying to take people for what they can. There are people who are clearly sincere believers who nevertheless also sort of skate the bounds of ethics. I'm not going to go into naming names. I find it very hard to trust that there is something to this. I'd say the best way to filter this information is say, that future plan sounds great. What have you got in the present? Always ask for a production system. But it's like the early version of some technology that was successful. Like, yeah, that's great. But, you know, most technologies fail. Most technologies go nowhere. Show me a working thing with this thing right now, and that will do the job. Um, Magic doesn't happen. That's a big thing to remind yourself of. There's a lot of people who seem to believe that magic happens if you just believe hard enough, and that's not how it works. Could you be wrong about all this? I certainly could. I've been wrong about Bitcoin plenty of times, and every time I've been wrong, it's because I assumed a rational market. Bitcoin is not a rational market. I actually sincerely think crypto is a counterexample for the strong, efficient market hypothesis. 
like the thesis that markets are always right and whatever the market says is clearly wisdom. I think that's really obviously false because the crypto markets are really obviously manipulated, really trivially obviously manipulated. You don't see bar type graphs where the price goes up in five minutes, holds for a few hours, and then goes down in five minutes on efficient markets that are well regulated. You see that on thin markets with bad regulation in commodities markets, forex markets, that sort of thing. You also see it in crypto, which is a sign that it's a very thin market with very little regulation and a lot of ways to manipulate. So I could be wrong about this stuff and I would be delighted to be shown wrong, but I'd need to be shown it. Show me a use case for cryptocurrency where it does a job clearly better than whatever else. You know, there are limited uses. There are actual payment use cases for Bitcoins and Ether and so on. Obviously, the first consumer use case was buying things that your government didn't want you to buy. So that's good. Then it turned out that doing things that governments don't want you to do on a permanent immutable blockchain ledger turns out to be a silly idea and you get caught years later. But um, the, the want is there, you know, to do transactions without the loving eye of Sauron looking upon your every move. And for international transmission of money, um, people thought, oh, Bitcoin will obviously handily trounce Western Union. Ha <laughs> ha. And it turned out that real life is a bit more complicated than that. And there are remittance companies that currently use Bitcoin or Ether as a channel. They use Swift, they use Bitcoin, whatever. Um, and, it, uh, and the crypto channels might turn out to be more efficient that day, or they might not. You know, that is, in the best of circumstances, doing it as a business, it's as good at best. So, you know, these are real use cases. They're just very small ones. I'm not sure they're compelling use cases. This is another fate for technologies, by the way. You have technologies that do work, do their job. They do it perfectly well, but they lose out in the market because they're not outstandingly better in any particular way and they don't even have a niche. And then they sort of fade away because they haven't got the marketing. So there's all sorts of ways that it could sort of go nowhere in particular for many, many years. But I could be wrong. I like that. No, I think that's a frank and, and honest answer. I mean, I find this space absolutely fascinating, even as I'm pretty sure it's mostly a bad idea. It is really, really interesting to follow. Can you share like one positive thing about this blockchain movement that, uh, that you've taken away from it or you see in it currently? I'm not sure if it's entirely worth the effort, but it's been useful in terms of education. Like when someone comes up with a large and complicated idea with lots and lots of wrong pieces, that's a vast opportunity for saying, so this stuff doesn't work. Here's how things actually work. Like I didn't know any stuff about how the actual finance system works and the banking system, not in detail, until I started looking at this stuff and going, wait, that doesn't look right. And then I looked up how things actually work and I went, this is complete nonsense. Here's how they actually work. I mean, no journalist can be expected to know everything, right? Um, it's common to hear about people who cover stuff in news and they go, oh, they just wrote nonsense. So I try not to be that guy. I, I try to check stuff with people who know the area. So I try not to write arrant nonsense. Like some of my most popular blog posts um, just on the blog itself have been where I cover some piece of basic finance 101, but in crypto terms, you know, like here's how margin works on crypto exchanges that compared to ordinary securities or commodities exchanges. How does this work? How does that work that sort of thing so you know there's a great yearning for knowledge out there and i sort of have to learn stuff very quickly and then present what i've learned and check it with someone who knows what they're talking about <laughs> so i don't talk nonsense because that would be bad agreed man agreed well thank you for coming on the show i super appreciate it guys thank you for tuning in to this episode of what is crypto this was definitely a controversial one so i want you guys to do your own research the thing that I want you to do today is I want you to go on Google and I want you to search what is Bitcoin. And I want you to find one or two articles that have a lot of traction, so who are near the top of the search engine. And I want you to read through those articles and learn about the positives and the negatives about Bitcoin. In this episode, David and I had a really deep conversation about what Bitcoin is not. And while some of these topics are very controversial to people who are heavy believers in the space, and while I even struggle to believe some of it as a believer myself, I can also see his point of view and his skepticism on the space. There's a lot of negative things as well that go around that may be detrimental to Bitcoin in the long run. So David makes a lot of good points. I'm really glad I had him on the show. He got me thinking a lot about my position around what is Bitcoin and what is not Bitcoin. Finally, guys, again, come join us in our Facebook group. We have a full discussion going on over there. 
Uh, any one of our listeners who wants to ask a question or dive deeper into a specific topic is more than welcome to do so. So please come participate. And finally, guys, just drop us a rating, drop us a subscribe, drop us a comment on iTunes. This really helps us out. It really boosts us up the rankings, and we really, really appreciate that. So anyways, guys, I'm your boy Nye, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Thank you.